Apparently Apple TV Plus is tightening its belt because after spending tons of money on original programming, it gets fewer viewers in a month than Netflix does in a day. Well, I'm quite a fan of Apple TV Plus. I think it's the best of the original streaming services. And so I'd just like to ask its executives, have you never thought of marketing your programs A few months ago, it seemed as if everyone in the media was going on about baby reindeer. I still have no idea what baby reindeer is because I haven't had Netflix for years. But credit where credit's due, people were talking about it. Some of Apple TV's shows are absolute humdingers. No one's ever heard of them. The irony is that you actually have to pay for Netflix. I have had months and months and months of Apple TV Plus and so far I haven't paid a penny. It's so free and easy with its free subscriptions, with its trial subscriptions I should say. And on top of that, Apple has this thing called family sharing. So in this purely hypothetical scenario, I might have bought a laptop from Curry's, the UK electrical retailer, and been given three free months of Apple TV Plus. And this means that my sibling also gets three free months. There's rarely been a time when I haven't had Apple TV Plus in the last couple of years. And I haven't paid for it. The one show that everyone's heard of is Ted Lasso, because it's won so many awards. All these Emmys and what have you. I always figured that tea was just going to taste like hot brown water. And you know what? I was right. Yeah, it's horrible. No, thank you. Welcome to England. I'll get to that a bit later, but for now, I want to talk about the five shows I really like. Number five, this is for the sci-fi fans, as several of these are, actually. Uh, it's for all mankind. Stand by for lift off. Three, two, one. It starts from the premise, what if the... Soviets had beat the Americans to the moon in 1969. And from there it becomes an alternative world history. Now the consequences spread like ripples in a pool so that, for instance, Chappaquiddick doesn't happen and Ted Kennedy becomes US president. So we follow a group of American pilots, astronauts, from their 20s until their 60s. A lot of you are probably thinking, oh, I bet it looks terrible. But no, the actors are all fantastic and the makeup is wonderful. It's surprisingly convincing. I think it takes a while to get going. Maybe that's just me. But I'm glad I stuck with it because after a while it becomes this very rewarding saga. Number four is the morning show in which Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon play news anchors in the competitive world of morning television. That doesn't sell it very well, does it? It's a scintillating workplace and boardroom drama that for the first series at least is largely centered around the Me Too phenomenon. To begin with, the third star of the series is Steve Carell as Mitch Kessler, an outwardly genial household name who's established a years long rapport with Aniston's character on screen. They're a double act if you like. As the series begins, the bombshell news drops in the American press that he's been having relationships down the years with several of the people who work on the show, some of them African-American women. And the question on everyone's lips is, was he taking advantage of his position in the workplace? It would have been easy for the writers to simply bash the Kessler character for the first 10 episodes but they don't do that. He's a rounded character, along with everybody else in the series. And sometimes you despise him and sometimes you feel quite sympathetic towards him. The second series, which was disrupted by the COVID pandemic, starts very badly, but finds its feet after a while. And while there's an element of tiredness about the third, it still knocks the socks off most TV programming. 
Number three, quirky sci-fi drama, Severance. Every time you find yourself here, it's because you chose to come back. I'm not going to say too much about this because I don't want to spoil the surprise. All I'm going to say is that I read some comments on Facebook that said it's the closest thing to the prisoner, the Patrick McGowan series from the 60s, that they've seen in tone. And I agree. Number two, a comedy show, Schmigadoon which takes the idea that's been used before in things like Buffy the Vampire Slayer of what would happen if you were in an environment where people just start singing and dancing like they're in a musical. It's like magic. We're in an actual musical. Please God, no. Everybody! A couple of doctors from the city head out into the countryside by car and wind up in the land of Schmigadoon, which is rather like the setting for Oklahoma or Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. The people are good, honest stereotypes of 1950s America, except they sing to advance the plot, which isn't a plot to our doctor friends. This is real life. When they've worn out that particular seam of humour, the down-home Americana, as seen through today's eyes, the same cast and crew move on to a second series, well, the target this time is material like hair and cabaret and Chicago. The gritty stuff that can also be lovingly lampooned. Maybe I'm biased because I like comedy songs. I'm in awe of people who are genuinely hilarious. And I'm in awe, equally, of people who are musical and can write songs. However, my favourite show on Apple is another single camera sitcom, Mythic Quest. These are leaders who trusted their inner voice. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. It's a bit like The Office, but its characters who you will grow to love are a bunch of oddballs who work in the games industry. The test of a comedy is, is it funny? Yes, it's hilarious, but it can also be very moving. This is a series that takes chances and can be quite profound, and I'm thinking in particular of one episode that is about the resident writer at the games company, a guy in his 80s, played by F. Murray Abraham, who won a Nebula Award when he was young and has been living off that reputation ever since. What exactly is women's studies? It follows the experiences of women and the contributions they've made to... Inquiry withdrawn. The episode I'm talking about is a flashback to his life as a young man when he was struggling to get stories published in pulp science fiction magazines and rubbing shoulders with the likes of Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov. If you're emotionally invested in this awful, pompous character, and I think you might be if you watch the show, then this emerges as just, well, I think it's one of the most beautiful pieces of television I've ever seen. Oi, mate, there's you. I believe it is. Wicked. You coaching football. You are a legend for doing something so stupid. I mean, it's mental. I'm going to give a special mention to Ted Lasso, which I do like very much. If you're not aware, it's about a football coach from Kansas who, despite knowing almost nothing about English football, i.e. soccer, comes over here to London to manage a team. And he's a kind of folksy nice guy in the Jimmy Stewart sense who makes the lives of all the cynical sour-faced British people around him. Whinging palms, as we're called by the Australians. Uh, he makes our lives better and richer with his get-up-and-go, can-do, optimistic spirit. And I know that sounds like an awful premise for a TV show, but they do it so well that you can't help get a bit misty-eyed at it all. At least for the first two series, then they run out of ideas and make a third one that is a complete retread of what they've done before. Completely redundant as far as I'm concerned. Never mind. I'd love to know what you think. And if you have any tips, please leave them in the comments. And I'll try to watch those shows when I get around to my 17th free trial. Because if Apple TV Plus has a business plan, I for one have no idea what it is.